The Zodiac Killer has been haunting the San Francisco Bay Area since 1968, terrorizing locals and puzzling police with his cryptic messages. He's one of the most infamous serial killers in history. But who is he? Recently, a new theory has emerged with an answer to that question. Hi there. Welcome to True Crime Recaps. This is not the Zodiac speaking. The identity of the notorious killer has eluded us for years now, and it's no secret that there have been a lot of theories about who it could be. But now, a group of volunteer investigators called the Case Breakers say they have compelling evidence that points towards a man named Gary Francis Post as the infamous Zodiac. In this recap, we're going to talk about why they think this decades-old mystery has finally been solved. Which would be nice, wouldn't it? What with the pandemic and the politics and all? As a human race, don't we deserve a win? Well, the case breakers think they can give it to us. Their group is made up of more than 40 former private investigators, journalists, law enforcement, and military intelligence. To solve this case, they based their findings on photos found in Gary's darkroom, physical similarities to the infamous Zodiac police sketch from 1969. And when they used the letters of his name as a sort of Rosetta Stone to solve the killer's coded letters, they say it all adds up to Gary Post. And not only that, they believe his killing spree started years earlier and included the murder of 18-year-old Sherry Jo Bates in Riverside, California in 1966. But not everyone agrees. There have been several names added to the potential suspect list over the years. Everyone from abusive fathers to the Unabomber Ted Kaczynski and even the police journalists who covered the case back in the day. And when it comes to Sherry Bates, her connection to the Zodiac has been debated for 55 years. Bizarrely, the first link to her murder came from the killer himself. He'd been sending letters and coded ciphers to the media for over a year, but in March 1971, the LA Times got a letter possibly referencing Sherry's unsolved murder. In it, the Zodiac made fun of the police, which was a common theme in his letters, and he had this to say about them. I do have to give them credit for stumbling across my Riverside activity, but they are only finding the easy ones. There are a hell of a lot more down there. So, here's what happened to Sherry Jo Bates. On Halloween morning 55 years ago, a groundskeeper found her body in an alley on the Riverside City College campus in California. Her throat was slashed, and she'd been stabbed in the chest and back more than 40 times. The murder weapon was never found, but it was something with a short blade, three inches or less, maybe a pocket knife. The attack was savage, but there was no sexual assault, and nothing was taken. Her purse was found half covered by her body. Her lime green Volkswagen was about a 100 yards away, still parked in front of the library where the 18-year-old had been studying the night before. Library books she'd just checked out still sat on the passenger seat. The keys were in the ignition, but the car wouldn't start. Someone had pulled out the distributor coil and condenser to make sure of that. Greasy palm and fingerprints were lifted from the car door. When she never came home, her father reported her missing earlier that morning. There were no witnesses, but there were a few clues at the scene. According to the police report, a man's Timex watch with paint stains on it was found 10 feet away. Now let's talk about that watch for a minute. The Timex had a white face and a broken black leather band. Their theory is Sherry tore it off his wrist because it was obvious she'd put up a fight. The watch hands were stopped at 1224, but based on autopsy results, they think Sherry was killed two hours earlier, around 1030 the previous night. The FBI managed to trace the watch back to where it was first sold, at a store on a military base in England. That fit with another clue they found. Size 10 wing walker boot prints were in the alley. Now, wing walkers were made for walking on airplane wings. They were military issued, but also sold in military surplus stores. Riverside County has two military bases and support services, so there was no shortage of suspects. Some skin and blood was found under her fingernails, and she'd managed to tear some of the man's hair out, too. It was still clutched in her fist when they found her. A trail of blood drops led away from her body onto the street, showing the direction her killer must have gone. Witnesses from the library said they saw a heavy-set bearded man and an old Studebaker car, but police weren't able to track the man down. And then, about a month after the murder, the Daily Enterprise newspaper got a typewritten letter in all caps, unsigned, 
no symbols, and it sounded sort of deranged. It was entitled The Confession. Basically, it covered all the details of the murder you just heard about, some of which hadn't been made public at the time. The author said he pulled the distributor out of her car so it wouldn't start, and he followed her out of the library and offered her a ride. When they got to the alley, the letter says, quote, I said it was about time. She asked me about time for what? I said it was about time for her to die. All that back and forth about what time it is seems like an interesting coincidence with the discovery of that broken watch. Could her killer have cut his own watch band and left it there to taunt the police? The Zodiac has always liked doing that. So the letter goes into motive, saying only one thing was on my mind, making her pay for the brush-offs that she had given me during the years prior. It went on to demand that the letter be published or more girls would die like Sherry. She was a pretty popular blonde in her freshman year at City College with dreams of being a flight attendant. She was dating a guy two years older than her. He was at school in San Francisco seven hours away at the time of the murder. But the weekend before, she'd gone to visit him and he'd proposed. Friends say she was afraid of the dark and wouldn't have walked off with a stranger, even if she needed a ride home. That's why police say she probably knew her attacker and trusted him. They had a suspect in mind, a boy that went to a high school with her and that was rumored to have had a crush on her. But in the 90s, they tested his DNA against what they had, and it wasn't a match. And what about all that DNA? With today's technology, that killer might have been in cuffs by now. But back then, in the mid-60s, DNA didn't mean as much. They managed to determine it was probably a white male, but it wasn't preserved as well as it might have been today, which means it's almost worthless now. But the hair clutched in her hand. They've still got that, and they're going to need it because Sherry's case is still unsolved. So who is Gary Post, and how did his name get connected to this? Well, it's not through forensics. The Riverside police have been silent about testing his DNA against the hair they have left from Sherry's case. Gary was a married Air Force vet living in California and working as a house painter. At the time of Sherry Joe's murder, he lived in the area and according to Fox News, he routinely visited a local hospital for follow-up care after a gun incident. The hospital was only 15 minutes from the alley where she was found in. And then there's the watch with the paint splatter on it and the military boot prints. As a house painter, he could have had a stained watch and he also served in the Air Force and would have had the type of boots described from the print. And then there's his similarity to the 1969 police sketch of the Zodiac, specifically his forehead. The case breakers point out that the scars on his forehead match the detail on the police sketch, which obviously makes us wonder. Are those scars or wrinkles on that police sketch? We always assumed they were wrinkles, but now that we think about it, it makes more sense for them to be scars. Witnesses described a relatively young man, and why would they think to tell the sketch artist about forehead lines unless they were very prominent and more of a scar? If they are scars, then Gary does look similar. He got his scars in a terrible car crash that killed his passenger while he was in the Air Force. Give that some thought. And I'll be right back with more in just a minute. What's stopping you from being truly happy? Is it your boss? Your job stress? Maybe a breakup? No matter what you've got going on, I can tell you from personal experience, you can start feeling happier now. Since I started talking to the licensed professional therapist at BetterHelp, I've gotten practical tips and tools to manage my anxiety and stress. BetterHelp is not a crisis line or a self-help service. It's professional counseling you can do securely and confidentially online without leaving the privacy of your home. And their licensed therapists are experts in a wide array of issues, ranging from depression and grief to relationships and self-esteem. I've been learning that there's a science to feeling happier, and thanks to their encouragement and help, I have a healthier perspective to deal with the crap life throws at all of us. I want you to start living a happier life today. As a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting our sponsor at BetterHelp.com slash recaps. Join over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health. Again, that's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash recaps. Now, back to the show. The case breakers also claim that his name is key to deciphering the coded letters the Zodiac sent to California newspapers during his killing spree and that his name is revealed in the letters. 
Gary is not necessarily a new name to the Zodiac list. He's been of interest to some Zodiac sleuths for a while. He died of natural causes in 2018 at the age of 80, but before he passed away, he was interviewed by the Bay Area Police in 2016. At the time, he'd been committed to a Northern California mental health facility for savagely attacking his wife and pushing her down the stairs. People who knew him believe it when the casebreakers say he's the guy. His former daughter-in-law says being around him, knowing his demeanor and his shadiness and twistedness, he's the Zodiac. And she said the 1969 police sketch was like a bell ringer for me. I saw that and thought, that's him, totally. And she's not the only relative that thinks he's the killer. Someone else contacted the San Francisco Chronicle years ago to say Gary tried to kill him with a hammer. A girl that grew up next to him and his family agrees that he's the guy. She says Gary and his wife used to babysit her in the 70s and early 80s. He was obsessed with guns and taught her how to shoot. And she witnessed his ongoing abuse of his wife over the years. She told Fox News he lived a double life. As an adult, thinking back, it all kind of makes sense now. At the time, when I was a teenager, I didn't put two and two together until I got older. It hit me full blown that Gary's the Zodiac. His daughter-in-law also told Fox News that he targeted young men who didn't have a father figure in a way that sounds somewhat similar to a Manson family situation. She said he controlled these guys and together they formed sort of a posse and did a lot of damage. One of those guys, who wants to be known only as Will, claims he was groomed into a killing machine before he escaped this group. He says Gary was an avid hunter who would kill anything that moved, and in one of the Zodiac letters to the media, he referenced the joy of killing people for sport since they were the most fun to hunt. He also claims to have seen him burying murder weapons in the woods, and the casebreakers say they have a source that has sworn statements from people who say Gary told them about his murderous alter ego. Obviously, this is a lot of circumstantial evidence, and not everyone agrees. For instance, Tom Voigt, who has been researching the killer for 25 years, told Rollingstone.com that it was completely bogus and hot garbage. He runs the website ZodiacKiller.com, and he's the author of Zodiac Killer, Just the Facts. According to him, no witness ever described lines on Zodiac's forehead. The sketch artist added them to fill it in. He says there was an amended sketch that removed some of those distinctive forehead lines, and according to witnesses, that amended sketch looks more like the killer. So let's talk about the infamous Zodiac. As you can probably guess, the Zodiac mystery goes down a lot of rabbit holes, but we're going to try and keep it simple because I'm guessing you don't have three hours to hear about this. Now, the first confirmed Zodiac murders were the shooting deaths of teenagers Betty Lou Jensen and David Arthur Faraday on December 20th, 1968. They were sweethearts just back from their first date, and they were shot while they were parked in an isolated area not far from Betty's home. The next verified Zodiac murder was on July 4th, 1969. Darlene Farron and Mike Majot were parked at the Blue Rock Springs Park golf course when someone walked up, shone a bright light into the car, effectively blinding them, and started shooting. Less than an hour later, the killer called the police from a nearby gas station payphone claiming responsibility for the shooting and the Jensen and Faraday murders in December. But here's what he didn't count on. Mike Majot survived, and he got a glimpse of the man. Here's the description he gave police. On the short side, around 5'8", heavy set with short curly light hair, no glasses, but a large face. On July 31, 1969, the Viejo Times-Herald, the San Francisco Chronicle, and the San Francisco Examiner got letters claiming responsibility for both murders, and for the first time, the killer introduced himself as the Zodiac with the infamous opening line, This is the Zodiac speaking. Each letter included a part of a cipher that all three papers were told to publish on their front page or more people would die. This was a running theme with his letters. The next attacks happened a couple of months later on September 27, 1969. It was just after 6 o'clock that night, and Brian Hartnell and Cecilia Shepard were enjoying a picnic at Lake Berryessa in Napa County when she noticed a man walking towards them. 
Before he reached their blanket, he ducked behind a tree, and the next time she saw him, he was wearing a black executioner-style hood with a white crosshair symbol and clip-on sunglasses over the eye holes. Like the other attacks, he was carrying a gun, but this time his M.O. changed. He told them he was an escaped prisoner, and he was there to take their money and their car and escape to Mexico. He made them tie each other up with some clothesline he brought with him. When neither of them could move, he stabbed them over and over, but miraculously they managed to survive long enough to call out to a nearby boat for help. They were in and out of consciousness, but Cecilia managed to describe the man she saw before he put on the hood. He was about 5'8", heavy set, with dark hair and glasses. Later, detectives spotted footprints from a size 10 wing walker, a military boot, and judging by how deep the prints were in the dirt, the description she gave of a heavy set man was accurate. Whoever had worn those boots had also left them a message on Brian's car door. The crosshair symbol and dates of the other two attacks were written there. And in case that wasn't enough, they also got a phone call from someone reporting two murders at the lake and claiming to be the killer. Two days later, Cecilia died, but Brian survived, and even though he hadn't seen the man without his hood, he thought he would recognize his voice if he ever heard it again. His impression was that the man was around his same age, in his early 20s. The next and last confirmed Zodiac victim was taxi driver Paul Stein on October 11th, 1969. Just before 10 p.m., Paul was driving a passenger in the upscale Presidio Heights neighborhood of San Francisco when the man shot him in the head as he was stopped at the intersection of Washington and Cherry Streets. Then his killer cut off a piece of his shirt and simply walked away. Witnesses in nearby buildings saw a man they think was the killer. They described him as white, mid-20s or early 30s, with a crew cut and glasses. Police got to the scene within minutes, but... Thanks to some mix-up, they didn't get that description of the shooter. Instead, they were told to be on the lookout for a black man. Meanwhile, the police actually saw a man who matched the witness description in the area at the time, but they didn't detain him. Later, the Zodiac himself mocked them in letters he sent the San Francisco Chronicle while he was taking credit for the murder. And just in case there was any doubt, he included a blood-stained piece of Paul's shirt. In the same letter, he also threatened to kill school children next, saying, I think I shall wipe out a school bus some morning. Just shoot out the front tire, then pick off the kitties as they come bouncing out. This killer was proving to be a chatty guy. The Chronicle got a greeting card on November 8th, 1969, with another piece of Paul's bloody shirt and another cipher to print on the front page along with a warning that he was going to do his thing if he was ignored. He added the words, Des, July, Aug, Sept, Oct, equals seven. They figured it might be referencing other unidentified victims, and he wasn't quite done talking yet. I'll be right back to tell you more about what he had to say right after this. It's never too early to start gift shopping for the holidays, especially because today you can save big on a gift they'll use every day. Raycon wireless earbuds. I wore mine on a 12-hour travel day, and I can honestly say these are the most comfortable, best-sounding earbuds I've ever used. Plus, they give you eight hours of playtime and a 32-hour battery life, so you don't have to listen to the sound of silence. You also get a built-in mic, and you can take calls on your earbuds with the press of a button. So this holiday season, get them something they can use for calls or music, for work or play, at home or on the go, or pick up a pair for yourself. Trust me, you're going to use them every day. Go to buyraycon.com slash recaps today to unlock exclusive deals up to 20% off your Raycon order. But hurry, this offer is available for a limited time only, and you don't want to miss it. That's B U Y. R-A-Y-C-O-N dot com slash recaps to unlock up to 20% off your Raycons. Buyraycon.com slash recaps. Now back to the show. The Chronicle got a seven-page letter the next day. This one said police actually stopped him near the Paul Stein murder to ask if he'd seen anyone suspicious. He told them a man had run by with a gun and they took off. He thought that was pretty funny. He also said the descriptions of him were just disguises, and when he wasn't doing his thing, as he called it, he looked totally different. He claimed he used airplane cement on his fingertips to prevent him from leaving fingerprints on the scene, and any prints the cops had from the cab he claimed he planted there. He also said he was going to stop taking credit for his crimes, and no one would know when he killed again. Here's a quote. 
They shall look like routine robberies, killings of anger, a few fake accidents, etc. In the same letter, he implied he had a bomb and he included the recipe for it and an elaborate diagram showing how he was going to use it to blow up a bus. In April 1970, the Chronicle got another letter. This one teased, My name is blank, with a 13-symbol cipher to try and unravel for the name. Apparently, the casebreakers believe that also reveals Gary's name. The Zodiac claimed to have killed 10 people by that time, and he included another diagram of a bomb for killing school children. Eight days later, he sent a greeting card asking the paper to publish his bomb threats and tell people to start wearing buttons with his Zodiac symbol. When the people of San Francisco didn't start wearing his buttons, he sent another letter at the end of June 1970 saying he had punished them for ignoring his demands. He claimed he shot a man in a parked car and buried a bomb somewhere. He included a map and another cipher. If they could crack his code, they would find the bomb. A month later, when they still weren't wearing his merch, he sent another short letter complaining about it and mentioning a rather interesting ride he gave to a woman and her baby. That was a woman named Kathleen Johns. In the Modesto area in March, she'd been flagged down by another driver telling her there was something wrong with her tire, but it was a trick. When he fixed it for her, he actually loosened the lug nuts and the tire came off. Then he gave her a ride and tried to attack her, but she jumped out with her baby. Crazy, huh? Two days later, he sent a longer letter. Over five pages, he described torturing his slaves, as he called his victims. He included a quote from the Gilbert and Sullivan operetta, The Mikado, which is about the son of a Japanese emperor who agrees to a beheading as long as he can be married to the woman he loves for a month. The Zodiac also added a PS saying that the Mount Diabolo Code concerned radians. He was quiet for a couple of months, and then right before Halloween in 1970, Paul Avery at the Chronicle got a greeting card telling him he was doomed, and the number 14. Written as the number 4-teen was thought to mean there was an unidentified 14th victim. Then Zodiac went silent until January 29, 1974. That letter included a score that read Me 37 SFPD 0, which indicated he had 37 victims, even though Paul Stein was his last confirmed murder in 1969. But if you remember, in an earlier letter, he also said he wasn't going to advertise his crimes anymore and they would appear to be random murders. The casebreakers said Gary's name is key to solving the coded messages the Zodiac sent. But before they revealed his identity, two of the ciphers were already solved. The first one, known as Z408, because of the number of characters in the puzzle, was solved in 1969 by husband and wife Donald and Betty June Harden, who had seen it in the paper. It said, I like killing people because it's so much fun. It is more fun than killing wild game in the forest because man is the most dangerous animal of all. To kill something gives me the most thrilling experience. It is even better than getting your rocks off with a girl. The best part of it is that when I die, I will be reborn in paradise and all the people I have killed will become my slaves. I will not give you my name because you will try to slow down or stop my collecting of slaves for my afterlife. The next cipher, called Z340, stumped everyone for 51 years. It was finally solved in December 2020 by a team of citizen sleuths. They are David Orenchak, a software developer from Virginia, Sam Blake, an Australian mathematician, and Jarl van Eyke, a warehouse operator and computer programmer from Belgium. It said, I hope you are having lots of fun in trying to catch me. That wasn't me on the TV show, which brings up a point about me. I am not afraid of the gas chamber because it will send me to paradise all the sooner because I now have enough slaves to work for me where everyone else has nothing when they reach paradise. So they are afraid of death. I am not afraid because I know that my new life will be an easy one in paradise death. Great. The TV show he mentioned was a local talk show called The Jim Dunbar Show. Two weeks before that cipher was sent, someone called into the show claiming to be the Zodiac. I guess he took offense. The last two ciphers, known as Z32 and Z13, are still unsolved, although a French engineer named Fekal Zirawi claimed to have solved them in June 2021, and he told the New York Times that the puzzles revealed a different name, Lawrence K., 
Lawrence, who also went by the last name Kane, has been a popular person of interest for Zodiac sleuths for years. He died in 2010, but his name was linked to this case because he worked in the same Lake Tahoe Hotel and Casino as Donna Lass, a nurse who disappeared in 1970. She's long been considered to be a victim of the Zodiac thanks to a cryptic postcard he sent the Chronicle featuring an ad for a Lake Tahoe condo and the words, Pass Lake Tahoe Areas, and Sought Victim 12. Her body was never found, but the casebreakers say they can place Gary Post in Tahoe at the time and even hint that they may know where her body is buried. But as of right now, her disappearance remains a mystery. But it's one that other people claim they've solved. Don't go anywhere. I'll be right back to tell you more about some of the people linked to this case. There's no one-size-fits-all solution when it comes to hair care. A product that works wonders for curls might make straight hair limp and greasy. Or in my case, I'm always on the lookout for a shampoo and conditioner that can work a miracle on my frizzy hair. Thanks to my personalized pros routine, I can honestly say I have never been more in love with my hair. First, pros starts by asking about you as a person with their in-depth consultation. And the questions are really unexpected, like if hair loss is genetic in my family and what my zip code is so they can take environmental factors into consideration. Next, pros analyzed all my answers and came up with a unique blend of ingredients that should be in every product of my custom routine. And the results are incredible. My hair has more volume, it's smoother, and it just feels healthier overall. Plus, all their ingredients are sustainably sourced, ethically gathered, and cruelty-free. And if you're not 100% positive pros is the best hair care you've had, they will take the products back, no questions asked. Pros is the healthy hair regimen with your name all over it. Take your free in-depth hair consultation and get 15% off your first order today. Go to pros.com slash true. That's P-R-O-S-E dot com slash true for your free in-depth hair consultation and 15% off. Now back to the show. So why is Lawrence Kane such a good prospect? For one thing, he served in the Naval Reserves, which is where he might have learned how to create the ciphers that have baffled people for so many decades. A 1962 car accident left him with a brain injury, which could be the reason for the seemingly uncontrollable urges to kill that the Zodiac mentioned. But... Even before the accident, he wasn't a great guy. He was arrested for peeping in 1961 and for prowling in 1968, according to Biography.com. As early as the 1980s, a detective named Harvey Hines was convinced he was the killer. And Darlene Farron's sister ID'd him as a man who was pestering Darlene at the restaurant where she worked. And one of the police officers who saw the suspect after Paul Stein's murder says Lawrence is the guy who looks most like the man he saw. And remember that woman and her baby who was actually in the same car with the Zodiac? She also says Lawrence looks like the guy who tried to attack her that day. So why has he never been arrested? Well, like all the names on the is he or isn't he the Zodiac killer list, there's no actual forensic evidence linking him to the murders. And experts say his handwriting was not a match to the writing found on the letters. Another popular person of interest for Zodiac sleuths is Ross Sullivan, mainly because of his connection to Sherry Bates. Ross was a student at Riverside City College when Sherry was there, and he worked at the library where she was last seen. According to the History Channel, his co-workers said he was creepy, and after the murders, he disappeared for several days. He also wore glasses and kept his hair in a crew cut similar to the 1969 police sketch. He had also been hospitalized several times for bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. He wasn't in the armed forces, but he did like to wear an army jacket and military-style boots. And the reference to the Mikado musical by Gilbert and Sullivan might be a clever reference to his last name. And then there's Arthur Lee Allen, the only official suspect ever named by police. Unfortunately, Arthur died of a heart attack in 1992 without being charged. He was a convicted child molester who had the same type of gun used by the Zodiac and he wore the same military style boots and a watch with the Zodiac's crosshair symbol. 
He was questioned by police in 1969 and again in 1971 after tips came in pointing to Arthur. Plus, Mike Majot ID'd him out of a police lineup as the guy who shot at him and Darlene at Blue Rock Springs Park. Bloody knives were found in his car, but he said he used them for killing chickens. What the? He served in the Navy but was dishonorably discharged for sexual misconduct, the same reason why he was fired from his job as a schoolteacher. They searched his house but couldn't find anything else tying him to the murders, and in 2002, they tested his DNA against a small sample they got off a stamp from one of the letters, and it wasn't a match, but anyone could have licked that stamp, and the sample was so small that it was hard to be tested accurately against. And speaking of those letters, police say they got handwriting samples from both his right and left hand, and it wasn't a match to the Zodiacs. But how hard would it be to disguise your handwriting? Unfortunately, preserving DNA wasn't a priority when the Zodiac was terrorizing California, so there's not really too much available to prove that anyone is the Zodiac without some kind of confession or solving the ciphers to reveal his name beyond a shadow of a doubt. As for this latest claim about Gary Post, well, who knows? He might be the Zodiac killer, but then again, these other suspects also sound like they might be the Zodiac killer. And these three names are just the tip of the iceberg. There are many other people named over the years with just as compelling circumstantial evidence to back them up. But for now, according to the FBI, the Zodiac Killer case remains open. And as for Sherry Bates, the Riverside police say her murder is not connected to the Zodiac. But the reason why is also hotly debated. A year after she was killed, the police got another letter. This one was handwritten and it said, More will die. In 2016, investigators got an anonymous typed letter apologizing for sending the handwritten letters back then. They called it a sick joke made by a sick teenager at the time. They used DNA from that 2016 letter to track down the author, and they were eventually cleared as a suspect for Sherry's murder and the Zodiac killings. But the thing is, that typed confession was a different type of letter altogether. That letter included details only the killer would know, and it appears that this person only confessed to sending the follow-up handwritten letters. So, it's all a huge puzzle. It would be fantastic to get it solved, though, wouldn't it? So here's hoping the case breakers have more to back up their claims than just random coincidences. But they do have a lot of confidence. They're also working on the murder of Jimmy Hoffa and the D.B. Cooper hijacking. Thank you so much for spending this time with me today. If you like getting all the crime in half the time, I'm Chris. And this is True Crime Recaps, and it would mean the world to us if you would take a second to hit like, subscribe, and the bell so you never miss a recap. Amy and I are here every week with new stories. Until next time, take care.